Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, look what I just scored. A Tech 2225 50 megahertz dual channel analog oscilloscope. Beauty, always wanted one of these because it is one of only three oscilloscopes, I think it is, that I know of on the market that has a 500 microvolt per division vertical scale. And that's great for um, measuring real low noise stuff, the output of power supplies and things like that. So I thought it'd be just a real nice scope to have. I always got a, always wanted one and I was lucky enough to pick one up here local. These are quite uh, rare to find these in Australia here, but uh, in, in the US they're fairly common. It's a really nice 50 megahertz, um, late 80s kind of vintage uh, Tektronics scope. And I've mentioned it before, you should have an analog scope in your lab. You can get them for 50 or 100 bucks, under 100 bucks, 50 megahertz dual channel like this one. Very handy analog scope to have. You know, if you're just relying on your Rigol, you know, digital scope, it's not too bad, but they're noisy and, you know, they're just not as real time as a good analog scope. I highly recommend you get one. So I thought we'd just, uh, I'll do a teardown. Everyone wants to see a teardown, of course, vintage teardown. I'll do that as a separate video because people like the separate teardown videos. And, but for this one, I will just uh, uh, basically uh, power it up. Did I get a dud or not? I don't know. Um, we'll power it up, check it out, um, check out all the basic functions. So this will be a reasonably uh, basic guide on how to test a second-hand scope like this, if you pick one up on eBay cheaply, I got this one for 100 bucks Australian, which is pretty darn good uh, value. You can pay more than this in the US. So I was pretty lucky to get this. Um, but this should be a reasonable guide to just what to uh, check once you get it. Is it within calibration? Do all the functions work and stuff like that? So let's power it up, give it a go. Now, one thing I like about the Tech uh, 2200 uh, series. There's a whole bunch of them. This one, the, the specific 2225 I've got here is, um, I think there's only one other which has a 500 microvolts uh, per division vertical scale. But um, the thing is, they're quite small and they're quite lightweight. This one only weighs about six kilos. So if you're buying a secondhand analog scope on eBay, weight can be a big factor because you'll pay shipping costs, especially if you're buying it from uh, the US or some other country and you're shipping it overseas it can be a big deal so this one's reasonably uh, lightweight in the scheme of things um unfortunately this one didn't have a um this one doesn't have the actual uh, bail on it the the tilting bail the tilting handle which comes over because it was a rack mount uh unit so but that's not a big deal you know if if you need it really portable then the tilting bail is important but some you can pick up a bit cheaper because uh, they don't have the tilting bail on they come out of a rack uh, system or something like that. Now, it's a good basic layout dual channel analog scope. I really like it. You've got your dual channel inputs here, you've got your uh, horizontal, you've got your uh, triggering totally separate over here. This has got uh, auto, full auto, uh, peak to peak triggering on it, which is really nice. It's got, um, it, instead of a dual uh, time base, this is only a single time base, but it does actually have um, a times 5, times 10, and times 50 mag. So it works like a dual time base, but it doesn't have the full uh, capability as you get on a full dual time base analog scope. Now let's take a look at the vertical here, and uh, you'll see that the reason I like this one is because it has a times 10 magnification. Most scopes on the market will only have times 5 verti vertical mag. So it says uh, pull cow for times uh, 10 mag. So if you pull this here and you get this yellow, you can notice the uh, yellow there on there, so you can tell if it's uh, pulled out at a glance there, which is a really nice uh, feature of this. Now conveniently, it's got uh, two different uh, two different positions here for your times one and your times ten probe. Uh, because this doesn't have like an automated probe detection for times ten, it doesn't have menus and all that other stuff where you can and on-screen display of the volts per division. Uh, if you're using a times ten probe, which you will be most of the time, then you take this position over here, so you don't have to multiply it in your head. You just look at the one that you're using, and I find that really quite uh, handy. And of course it's got all the basic stuff 
on your vertical that you want. It's got uh, AC and DC and ground coupling on uh, both channels. It's got uh, invert. It's got an add uh, mode where you can add both channels, and it's got a subtract mode as well because that's what this channel two invert thing here does. If you want to subtract them, well, you invert channel two. So you're adding channel one plus minus channel two, which means that you're subtracting them. So it's got subtract mode uh, and it's got alt and chop as well. And um, my, almost most uh, scopes have these because it's not a, this is not an old school dual beam oscilloscope. This is a dual trace oscilloscope. And the difference is actually quite significant, which a lot of people don't understand. This only has one, um, one beam inside, so it can only project one uh, beam of electrons at once onto the screen. So um, if we put it into, if we display both channels here, and we, uh, here we go, I've got it turned on here. It does actually work, by the way. It seems to at least power up. Now we've got the dual uh, channels here, and we can adjust those like this, and that's just uh, fine. Now, it's on alt mode at the moment. What it means is that the a dual trace oscilloscope can only draw one trace at a time. So it can only draw that one and then that one. And this is what alternate means. Alt means it alt it alternates between these two traces. It draws this one and it draws that one and back at that one. And that's really good for higher time-based settings. Now you'll see this effect if we turn it down to one millisecond per division, two milliseconds, you'll start to see it very shortly. There you go. Ten milliseconds per division, you really start to see it. 20 milliseconds, you'll see it draws that one, then it draws that one, and whoop, there we go. So that's why you need chop mode, because what chop does, instead of alternating between the two, it um, it slices, it, 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 well, it still alternates between the two, but it does it uh, not for a whole sweep. It does it uh, like this. It just jumps between them like this. You, you can't actually see it, because you can't see it vertically, because it disables the uh, trace during that. but um, it does actually, it chops between the two like that all the way across. So even at very slow time-based speeds, you can get both traces on the screen at once. And of course, that, that works up at higher frequencies as well, but it won't be as bright. And really, you should uh, switch to uh, alt mode if you're up on the higher settings like that. As I said, one of the great things I love about this scope is that it has 500 microvolts per division uh, vertical scale. Now, as, as you can see on the uh, dial here, it only goes down to 5 millivolts per division, but it's got a times 10, uh, times 10 vertical amplifier here, and most scopes on the market will only have a times 5. So they'll typically might go down, a good oscilloscope will go down to 1 millivolt per division vertical scale, but this one does better, does uh, twice as good as that at 500 microvolts. So if you put on 5 five millivolts vertical scale and you pull that knob bingo we've now got 500 microvolts per division which is absolutely fantastic uh vertical scale it is absolutely awesome i love it now we're going to check out this thing uh just just to make sure what its um noise floor is like to make sure it's actually uh good make sure it's in the vertical scales are within cow that's the first thing we want to check then we'll move on to the horizontal and move on to the triggering and things like that but uh, let's see um, if this thing basically uh, works so let's give it a basic check out first thing we're going to do is make sure we get both traces on the display here so we're going to put it into uh, dual channel position uh, alt is a good one just sort of mid-range on your uh, horizontal time base here at, you know one volt per division or something like that doesn't really matter and uh, yes we are getting two traces here. Now we want to test the uh, focus of the traces. As you can see, it really goes out of focus at both. Oh, it's more towards one end, but as long as you can actually get that reasonably sharp. Now that's a pretty good sharp trace. I really like that. No problems at all. And next you want to test the intensity of it. The intensity is really, it goes up really, really bright. I like that. And basically you want to turn that up to the fastest time base um, setting you can get. In this case, it is uh, 500, sorry, 50 microsecond, sorry, 50 nanoseconds per division. 
Um, and that is at full brightness with dual channels up. So that's really good. And I can't see any uh, screen burn in here because these CRT displays, um, if, if people have just left them on at full intensity, then they can get burned in. But there's no signs of, of burn in there at all. And we'll uh, check the horizontal course and fine here. So we move it across like that. It looks all right. There's a little bit of a... There's a little bit of a wiggle there. I don't know if you can see that. Let's turn the vertical right up. No, it doesn't seem to matter, but there's a little eh, little slight wiggle there. I'm not sure what that is, but uh, make sure you can get the full horizontal uh, trace on the screen like that. And you can do fine and coarse adjust. So it looks like both fine and coarse work just fine. You want to be able to center it on the screen like that. No problems at all. Uh, next thing you want to do is you want to test the trace rotation when you buy it. Um, if it comes from a different uh, part of the world, you may have to uh, do some trace rotation. So you want to make sure that works. Line it up with uh, one of the lines on the screen there, one of the craticules, and uh, it's spot spot on. I like it. So our uh, focus intensity works, our horizontal position works, our vertical position works works you want to uh, make sure that the line is nice and flat and it doesn't curve you can see it starts to curve when it gets down to the bottom of the scope down there but that's of the uh, display down there but that's fine so both uh, uh, so that's the channel 2 position and the channel 1 position goes all the way up as well no problems it looks like it's working an absolute treat so far and the next thing we want to do is plug in our function generator. Now I'm using my um, Agilent 3000X series oscilloscope, the WaveGen module from that, because that's the highest frequency uh, general purpose function generator I've got um, here in the lab. So uh, what I've done is I fed in a one kilohertz uh, sine wave. There it is. There's my uh, uh, scope up there, and I've got it set to a one kilohertz uh, sine wave at 400 millivolts peak to peak. Now, the reason it's 400 millivolts is because that will give us a uh, full scale down here on our um, scope. You can do it at other values, but it's just, uh, I just like to get um, full scale here. Now, uh, this thing is supposed to output 400 millivolts per division. My vertical scale here on channel one is 50 millivolts per division. And as you can see, if I put it right down there on the bottom, it's just shy of the um, upper um, marker there. So really, it's um, slightly out of cow on the vertical channel. They're not a huge amount. I'm not um, overly concerned about that. Now let's try channel two as well. Let's, uh, it's 50 millivolts per division. Once again, it hasn't triggered from there because it's still triggering off uh, channel one over here. So we need to uh, the source to be uh, trigger two, bingo. So we're now testing our uh, trigger capability from channel one, channel two, works just a treat. We'll have to test uh, external later, but uh, vertical mode will uh, just uh, select, select between the uh, two of them basically. And we select it to channel two there. There we go, not a problem. It's, uh, it's reasonably clean and nice. I like it. And look, you can actually see, if you look in there, you can actually see the step response of the DAC inside the Agilent 3000 uh, series function generator. You can, let me try and turn that, oh, sorry, wrong channel. There we go, there we go, look at that. You can see, you can see the DAC, you can see the steps in the output DAC because it's a digital function generator, not an analog. See the steps in it, look at that. Beautiful, I like it. So anyway, let's turn it back and, whoop, really high intensity there. And channel two, once again, it is short. Um, it's it's slightly out of cow, but at least it's consistently out of cow on both channels. So uh, we'll have to uh, pop it open later, find the uh, adjustment uh, pot, and uh, adjust the vertical. But that's uh, good enough. I wouldn't uh, complain about that too much at all. And I've changed the function gen to 4 volts per division. So um, now I'm at 0.5 volts per division on channel 2, and it's exactly the same, it's out by the same amount, so I really like that. Plug it into channel one here and uh, trigger off channel one. Let's turn it up and bingo, it's out by, once again, the same amount. It's very consistent across there. So uh, really, I'm, I'm quite uh, happy with that. And you can test 
all the scales in the same way you can see that that one is uh, uh, half of the value we had before and so forth so it looks to work a treat on all ranges really I'm quite happy with that and one more check right down at the low end I've set the function gen to 40 millivolts peak to peak and we've got it on 5 millivolts per division and once again out by the same amount beautiful I love it it's working a treat and it's relatively uh, well it's it's very noise free down at 5 millivolts per division now let's try and uh, take it down a bit further and try this uh, times 10 magnification gain now unfortunately my function generator only goes down to 10 millivolts peak to peak and that's not low low enough to test uh, the 500 microvolts per division range which this thing's capable of so I have built this little contraption here which is uh, four 50 ohm terminators uh, it, wired in parallel onto the uh, coax here and I've set my function generator to 50 ohms output and just so happens I've got a little Dave CAD drawer in here which uh, shows what's going on the function gen is set to 10 millivolts peak to peak and that's into a 50 ohm load because I've turned on the internal 50 ohm load in the function generator so if we had a single 50 ohm terminator here we've actually got four but if we had a single one then we would get our 10 we would get that value 10 millivolts peak to peak into 50 ohms but because we've got four in parallel like this it's actually 12.5 uh, ohms total and if you do the math it comes out to drops it down to four millivolts peak to peak which is great because we've got eight divisions on our screen here 500 microvolts per division gives us four millivolts peak to peak full scale fantastic and here it is it this is not on uh, times five uh, sorry times 10 mag but if we pull it bingo there's the there's our uh, sine wave in on times five mag now you notice that it's actually more than four millivolts peak to peak and that is not because of the scope that's an error in our function generator if we go up here and we plug it into our Agilin up here check it out we actually get yep you probably can't see it there but it's actually 4.7 millivolts peak to peak so the function generator isn't actually spot on if we go into the wave generator there it is 10 millivolts peak to peak there's obviously uh, some error in that as you'd expect when you get down that low and uh, basically we are getting 4.7 millivolts peak to peak I've got the average in uh, turned on there if we uh, turn the average in off we can actually see that it's a bit noisier than that but uh, you turn the average in on and bingo so this thing is uh, our Tech 2425 is working a treat. I love it. Now you can actually see when we've got no input down here, it's actually picking up a whole bunch of noise on times five, um, uh, times 10 mag. Sorry, I'm so used to saying times five uh, magnification for vertical. This is times 10. So uh, that's the same on channel one, or let's try channel two. Oh, it's not as bad on channel two. So if we turn them both on there, you'll uh, notice that um, oh, what have we got here we've got to uh, add there we go that's the problem there's your problem right we've got alt mode and look at uh, channel one is a bit channel one is a lot noisier it's got something on there so something's going on there it's not the best when you turn it down you can notice a bit more noise but you turn the time base up it's definitely got something something on that so I'm going to actually apply a uh, terminator to that and see if we can get that to go away yes it certainly does if we terminate that it's gone so likewise on channel 2 so I'm not sure where that's coming from maybe something internally of course if I put my hand near it or my hand on the control something like that so when you're measuring low noises like this just uh, it noise pickup is a major issue but um, I do deem that to be uh, pretty decent and uh, working reasonably well right down at its 500 microvolts per division. Now we have to check out our horizontal as well. Now I'm feeding in my 1 kilohertz signal and I've got it set to 0.1 milliseconds per division. 100 microseconds per division and you'd expect to get 10 divisions there but you don't. It's actually short of that. So uh, the horizontal isn't... Uh, 
isn't really uh, spot on. That needs to be uh, adjusted as well if you want to calibrate this thing. I mean, you know, if, if you just want to get uh, signals on there, then, you know, it's it's good enough. But, uh, yeah, I would I would be uh, tempted to go in there and uh, tweak that just so that's, that's a bit too far out, I think. I'm not happy with that. So we'll have to uh, cow that internally. And we need to check our trigger as well, of course, now. So we'll take our trigger level here and... We just uh, adjust it and make sure it goes, uh, make sure it goes between pretty close to the positive and negative um, values there, and it certainly does. And uh, if we uh, choose the negative slope trigger and do the same thing, yep, yeah, that's working perfectly, no problems at all. And that's in the peak to peak auto triggering mode. We also want to test the uh, normal mode as well. So we move it over to normal and we turn it back to peak to peak, and you see it, boom. It uh, goes straight in there, but if we go to normal mode, once we get past that trigger threshold up there, it should vanish. So, yep, it does. There you go. And likewise on the bottom side, once we reach that just past the negative uh, bottom of that waveform down there, bingo, gone. And once again, then positive and negative, and it works a treat. So normal mode works as well. And we'll check the single sweep mode over here. So take it all the way over and we get nothing on the screen. This is where you're probably going to want to turn your intensity up like this and then press the trigger button. There it is. Bang. No problems at all. And a very simple way to test your trigger hold off down here is to set it to minimum and note the brightness of the trace here. And as you turn your hold off control up, it should dim like that and that's a very basic test that indicates that the trigger hold off is working as well and we're going to want to do a quick test on the external input to make sure it works as well um now it's triggering off channel one at the moment up there but if i turn it down to external here and external and the source actually to uh, external because this external mode you can choose between the 50 hertz line frequency or external divide by 10 or external or uh, z input but there you go, it's, uh, tri and it's triggering stably, and if I disconnect that, of course, it loses its trigger. Works a treat. And we'll just check our line triggering here as well. This means that it actually gets the trigger source uh, from the 50 hertz mains, or if in the US it'll be 60 hertz uh, mains, but it's 50 here. So I've set my function generator to 50 hertz, and I, if I go below 50 hertz, you'll see it scroll in one direction, going across like that and if I go above 50 Hertz it'll go back in the other direction and of course if you had the ex if you had it exactly the same frequency as the main frequency it would actually be stationary but uh, I can only adjust my function generator in 0.1 Hertz increments so my mains here in uh, Sydney at the moment is somewhere between 50 point zero that's 50 point zero it's going in one direction and 50 point one Hertz there you go, so it's somewhere in between there. So the mains frequency in Sydney at the moment is probably 50.05 hertz or thereabouts, give or take. And we'll do a quick functional check on our um, trigger coupling up here. I've got an AC uh, coupling and it should work on DC in uh, peak to peak auto. Now if I turn it over to normal mode here, okay, in AC coupling it should uh, trigger, but on low frequency at my one kilohertz test signal, um, it should actually uh, completely attenuate that, so there's nothing to trigger on, so it should disappear. And high frequency, it should work a treat. And if you keep it in uh, auto mode, then it's pretty much, it's still gonna try and get a trigger there, even with the low frequency uh, filter on. But if we put on low frequency or reject filtering and we increase our uh, frequency here, then it should eventually, trigger at what have we got way up there it's way up there it's uh we're in the megahertz region at the moment let me turn that back frequency gen was a bit overzealous there but uh if i put that down to you know that's 90 kilohertz 50 that's 10 that's 10 kilohertz roughly and it's just starting to trigger at 10 kilohertz there you go so it's an order of magnitude uh, thing really so anything over 10 kilohertz this thing's going to trigger on nicely and likewise with the high frequency reject filter it's uh, 8 kilohertz at the moment if I turn up the frequency on that thing it should eventually not trigger at all 
Let's see what frequency it stops triggering at. 50 kilohertz, 60, 70, 80. 130 kilohertz, still got oh, 170. 160, 170 kilohertz, there you go, it's barely triggering now, 180 kilohertz, and it's stopped triggering completely. That works a treat. And if you're a really keen TV service tech, you might go in and test your TV line and your TV field modes, but I'm not going to bother. Now, let's go back to the horizontal here. I'm feeding in a 100 kilohertz sine wave, and uh, let's put it onto the alt horizontal mode shall we and it hasn't displayed anything at the moment that's big and it's on times five uh, magnification uh, time base that's because we haven't done the trace separation there it is bingo there is our magnified there's our magnified waveform so if we turn that down we can actually uh, separate the traces like that and actually get both of them on the screen at once so that's our times five uh, that, that looks like times 5 to me. I won't go in there and measure it, but it looks pretty good. And that's times 10. There it is. Okay, so that looks like it works an absolute treat. And we can even go to times 50 here, and bingo, there it is. That's the times 50 magnification. And of course, if we just go over to mag here, it'll just display the magnified waveform like that. But you can do both, or just the one. So... There you go, that looks like it works fine. I like it. And we should actually check that that value is spot on. I've got times uh, 10 mag at the moment with 100 kilohertz, so I'd expect uh, that to be 10 divisions across, and it's not, it's slightly out, just like it is with the um, main time base as well. But that should uh, come back in once we calibrate the main time base. Another thing we haven't checked is the probe adjust here. So I've got a times 10 probe, so we're actually going to use the times 10 uh, setting over here, not the times 1. So we're on 0.1 volts per division. It says we should be getting 500 uh, millivolts peak to peak at 1 kilohertz, are we? Well, not quite uh, 5 divisions there, so it's a little bit out, uh, but not a problem. And uh, we should be getting basically... 1 kilohertz, but once again the time base is out just like it was before. So looks like our uh, probe adjust is working fine. Let's have a quick check of the high frequency bandwidth here. I've, uh, fe I'm feeding in the highest frequency I've got from my function gen, which is 20 megahertz at uh, uh, 4 volts peak to peak. Now, um, this uh, once the problem with this Tektronix 2225 is if you use it on standard time base, it's just Really, it's not fast enough. That's as fast as it goes, okay? So, you know, I can see the 20 megahertz signal there, but you can't easily get in there and measure its frequency and stuff like that. So it really forces you to use your, uh, forces you to use the mag mode, which is okay. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just uh, not as nice as um, some other scopes, which have the main time base, which uh, goes down to that. But anyway, that's okay. And you'll notice that, it, it's a bit fuzzy here. Once again, if we go here, our frequency is uh, slightly out again, of course, because our main time base is out, as we've verified before. But uh, as you can see, the amplitude has dropped a bit from um, uh, where it was before. So uh, really, you know, it's, um, it's, it's starting to roll off there, I think. Now, one thing I didn't mention with the vertical channels is uh, that... Um, the bandwidth, the quota bandwidth, 50 megahertz, is only for uh, basically all of your, um, basically from your 5 millivolt range and up. Once you engage this times 10 magnification here, you will actually drop the bandwidth. In, in the case of this oscilloscope, its bandwidth with the times 10 gain on any either of these vertical channels, the bandwidth drops to about 5 megahertz, so it drops by an order of magnitude. Uh, basically so just something to watch out for you don't get the full 50 megahertz quoted bandwidth down at your very low um, uh, volts per division settings just a little trap to watch out for now as you can see my 20 megahertz signal looks a bit fuzzy there that's because my intensity is right up and it's causing a bit of a blooming effect on that signal now I you know I don't know if um, uh, the, you know, if there's actually something wrong with here and, there, and, there, and the triggering is, you know, there is a bit of 
trigger jitter or its performance at the high frequency isn't as good as it should be. I'm not sure. I'd need a reference uh, 2225 scope to actually uh, compare its true performance there. But anyway, that's more than good enough for my purposes. I'm not fussed with the high frequency uh, performance of this thing anyway. So um, now if you wanted to actually test the bandwidth, I've mentioned this before of um, any scope uh, really, but in particular these um, analog ones, is you can feed in a square wave. And if you don't have a 50 megahertz um, uh, function generator, that's fine. Just feed in a one kilohertz square wave with a very fast rise and fall time. And you'll be able to um, see, you'll be able, by measuring the, that's a square wave I'm feeding in now, it's not terminated properly and all that sort of stuff, but um, you'll be able to measure the rise time, the uh, rise and fall time of the oscilloscope uh, will basically be equal to um, uh, the, well, the bandwidth will be equal to 0.35 on the rise time. So um, that's a way to actually calculate the uh, bandwidth of your analog oscilloscope if you don't have a function generator to go to that high. I've, I've demonstrated that and mentioned that in one of my uh, Rigol blogs if you want to check it out. And the last thing I'm not fussy about, but the beam find. Yep, beam find works now. There you go. Uh, but that's uh, I've done some basic tests on this thing, and apart from um, some slight uh, calibration issues with the uh, vertical channel and the horizontal, they've uh, drifted a bit. I should be able to uh, bring those back into uh, cow by uh, tweaking uh, some pots inside or something like that. But um, yeah, I'm quite happy with this. It uh, it works. Um, it was advertised as working, but uh, I took a bit of a risk. I don't think there were it was actually showing any waveforms in the actual uh, ad for it, but uh, I deem that to be a winner. There you go. So, you know, don't be uh, too scared to buy these uh, analog scopes on eBay, but one tip, if you are going to buy it and you really want to be sure that it's working, at least um, buy one that actually shows both waveforms on both channels. Um, like hooked up to just the probe adjust signal or something like that. If you can, if you've got both signals on there um, and showing a basic waveform, then you can be pretty sure that uh, it's going to do uh, most of its basic uh, functions. And um, if it is slightly out like this, uh, then you can just start uh, tweak it back into calibration, get the service manual, and do that. So there you go. This is fun, and I really like this. It uh, seems to perform reasonably well. I'm quite happy with it. I'm going to download the uh, surface manual for it and uh, get in there and tweak the pots and have some fun, I think. See ya!